Good morning and welcome on this Friday morning, the 4th of December. Welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral where we've come to say our morning prayers. And wherever you are in the world, please feel welcome and bring your own concerns. We woke this morning to find snow all over the green grass. The earth, of course, was warm enough to melt that quite quickly, but there are still patches amongst the leaves here at my feet. So our first fall of the sign of winter as snow fell in the night. And I'm sure we shall have more of that before all that long. Um, we are saying our prayers in this Advent week, but it's also, as you will remember, if you've joined us day by day, the National Week of Trees and we've taken an indigenous English tree every day and this morning I've got a young specimen of a, a very common and very popular tree just here behind me in the hedge. It's a hawthorn and of course it's a great sign of the coming of spring in all its glory because at that time of year it's filled with white scented flowers in every hedgerow and they lie as white as snow in springtime and the scent of it as it's gathered is is very powerful indeed and very reminiscent of the coming of warmer times but at the moment it still has its leaves here and in the autumn of course it's it's covered in haws as we call them uh, and the fruits are, are immensely nutritious for the wildlife and the birds so when we planted the wild hedge there's plenty of hawthorn in it but they do grow into great trees and you can find lovely paintings of them by Stanley Spencer or you can find many pictures of them but you don't have to go far anywhere to in, in uh, uh, May time to find the hedges covered in white hawthorn. So we give thanks for that and that native English tree this morning, our tree of the day. The date, December the 4th, gives us, as we go back in history, in 530 BC, Cyrus the Great, King of Persia, died. And he, of course, was used uh, by the prophet Isaiah as an, uh, an emblem of God's own purpose in bringing the people home from exile. Uh, what else do we have today? In 749, St. John of Damascus died, the, who's known as the last of the fathers of the Eastern Orthodox Church, and he appears in our calendar with another, whom I'll mention in a moment. If we go a little um, farther on, in 1093, on this day, St. Anselm was consecrated as Archbishop, to become Archbishop of Canterbury. And of course, Anselm is buried here, and his, his altar is, is uh, something that we are very proud of because the people of his own land of Aosta created it out of their own stone and gave it to us as a gift a few years ago. And then at the same time we remember that in, where do we go next, 1791 The Observer, a Sunday newspaper, Britain's oldest Sunday newspaper was first published, 1798 the Prime Minister William Pitt, Pitt the Younger, introduced income tax for the first time as to help the nation's efforts in war against France. In 1865, Edith Cavell was born. We remembered her heroism. Uh, she was, of course, uh, executed, shot in the First World War, a nurse who had helped British soldiers escape across to the Dutch border from Belgium. And uh, we remember her forgiveness of all those who were um, intending to, to kill her. Uh, her statue is, is there just off Trafalgar Square, as you will remember. In a more comic way, the literally comic, uh, in 1937, the, the comic The Dandy was issued. I remember that well, as uh, one uh, in youth used to read either The Beano or The Dandy and get fun from it. Well, The Dandy was issued, it, it ended in 2012, and The Beano uh, began in 1938, a year later than The Dandy, and it's still going. So all those comic characters we give thanks for, which cheer our day. In 1976, the composer Benjamin Britten died, age 63. He's too important a uh, 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 composer, and of church music too, for us to think about today. We will give him special place uh, across the weekend. 
But the one we will remember is the fact that in 1637, on this day, Nicholas Ferrer, the leader of the Little Gidding community, died. And that was a community dedicated to spiritual discipline and social service. And we give thanks for uh, Nicholas Ferrer, but we will think of him in our reflection. So let's begin our prayers. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Reveal among us the light of your presence, that we may behold your power and glory. Blessed are you, sovereign God of all. <clears throat> to you be praise and glory forever. In your tender compassion, the dawn from on high is breaking upon us to dispel the lingering shadows of night. As we look for your coming among us this day, Open our eyes to behold your presence, and strengthen our hands to do your will, that the world may rejoice and give you praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God for ever. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. Our psalm on the fourth morning of the month is Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. One day pours out its song to another, and one night unfolds knowledge to another. They have neither speech nor language, and their voices are not heard, yet their sound has gone out into all lands, and their words to the ends of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun, that comes forth as a bridegroom out of his chamber, and rejoices as a champion to run his course. It goes forth from the end of the heavens, and runs to the very end again, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey dripping from the honeycomb. By them also is your servant taught, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often they offend? O oh, cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep your servant also from presumptuous sins, lest they get dominion over me. So shall I be undefiled, and innocent of great offence. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So our lesson from Scripture today is from the Revelation to John, the 21st chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honour of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb 
through the middle of the street of the city and also on either side of the river the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign for ever and ever. Beautiful passage, and the penultimate reading from the Revelation to John. Tomorrow we then come to the last reading on Saturday. So at this time we think of that vision. It's a heavenly vision, and if you like, we've arrived from the very beginnings of creation and the gift in the book Genesis, in that picture there, of the tree of life, and this journey through so many different kinds of books in the Holy Scriptures brings us to the sight of the tree of life again and the water of the river of life spoken of so often in the prophets in the psalms in the law in the writings of wisdom and in the teaching of our lord himself who used these images lovely sentences the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations and gates which are always open and at the same time an everlasting light provided by the Creator himself, the throne of God and of the Lamb, for there too is the Lamb, the Son of David, King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Good Shepherd, the, so many titles we can give to the way in which the Creator took human flesh and lived among us, laying aside power and embracing everything human in order to give his life for us. All those things are there in that picture and it's a picture I never get tired of reading and I'm always glad when I see that it's a lesson for the day as we, we do this in course so that today we give thanks for it on this day which began with snow at the beginning of winter the day when we have a remembrance of spring with our tree the hawthorn tree the may tree so all those things as we remember also this day as being the day on which in 1637 Nicholas Ferrer died. Ferrer died early in his mid-forties. He was the best friend of George Herbert, the poet, and Herbert had on his deathbed in 1633 sent all his poetry unpublished to Ferrer and said to him, please, if it's of quality to help people in their journey, publish it, otherwise burn it. And Ferrer published it that year. It's never been out of print since, but let's think of Ferrer today. For Ferrer had a, a scholarly brain and not very good health. Nevertheless, he set about in family business with the Virginia Company. He also tried Parliament. He was at that level of national life. And then suddenly, he decided to give everything up. He received deacon's orders, never asked for more, and took his family, his mother, his sister and her husband and family, his brother and his wife and family, 
to the manor house at Little Gidding and there they set up a community which would live a rhythm of life of spiritual discipline and faithfulness based on the offices of the Book of Common Prayer and the scriptures which of course in 1611 had been newly translated in the King James Version and of social action so that the community around them would benefit from education and schooling and healing and resources but the family themselves lived a life of worship and rhythmic creativity within that social action. They restored the little parish church near the manor house and they never had an occasion when a member of the family day or night was not kneeling before the altar and saying their portion of psalms for that little community said the whole psalter through every day. Sometimes there were offices during the day which people joined in and a little hymn was sung but everything was done simply without fuss and it was a very shall we say iconic Anglican kind of worship resting as we do on the prayers given to us in our liturgy and also on reflection on them, resting on the rhythmic reading of the scriptures and one of the things I'm most strong about is that we follow the lectionary day by day and read what it gives us for everywhere in scripture there is some kind of fruit that we can find and if we keep choosing our favorite bits then we go wrong and unbalance everything. That was not Ferrer's way. At the same time the household were engaged in creativity. They learned bookbinding and all kinds of other crafts and of course they, they kept a, a farm which, which fed them and the surrounding area. And at the same time Ferrer believed that that rhythm of Anglican worship and life was a, a, an encouragement to those around. That community was not to the pleasing of the um, parliamentary Puritan forces once the Civil War began. They had endured much criticism and uh, then Ferrer was, was dead by the time the war broke out. But King Charles I had come three times to Little Gidding and on his first two occasions as king and uh, uh, was given all the respect he was due but, but he also saw the work they were doing and what Ferrer liked them to do was to make a harmony of the Gospels and they did that uh, cutting out the passages to make a, a harmony which tried to go in a sort of chronological way and fit the four Gospels together and the king saw this and begged to have one made for him which they did and, and presented to him so that he could read the Gospels in a harmony. We know intellectually that it's impossible to fit those four Gospels into a harmony but actually in heart and mind and worship we do it all the time. We shall do it at Christmas time and oftentimes our telling of the story has elements of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John like jewels mixed together in it. So those harmonies became an icon of the reading of the passages which were set down day by day in the Book of Common Prayer in great faithfulness. Ferrer and his little Gidding community remain a huge icon and encouragement to us even today as we go about our worship for that kind of rhythm in life is something an individual can do but it's much more encouraging when we do it in community which is what we try to do day by day in a worldwide community of those who join us as we go through. Ferrer wrote to one of his nieces who was, and, and uh, it was a special anniversary for her, and um, he, he wrote a little letter because she was there living the life of the little Gidding community. And he said to her, I purpose and hope by God's grace to be to you not as a master, but as a partner and fellow student. Well, that's a lovely thought. 
as that community went about its life in great order and discipline and enjoyed the life they led. T.S. Eliot was overcome with both, I think, admiration but touched when he visited Little Gidding, which is in deepest Huntingdonshire. And uh, when he went there, it stayed with him. And of course, as most of you will know, his last of the four quartets is simply called Little Gidding. And there's a passage in it which talks of the, the whitening of the hedges of the May tree. It also talks of Charles I coming back to Little Gidding when he had just lost the Battle of Naseby and knew that this was the end, really, of, of any chance of victory. He came as a broken king back to Little Gidding to take strength from it one last time. And you'll hear that resonance as I read just a passage from Little Gidding by T.S. Eliot. Catch the pictures as they go through. If you came this way, taking the route you would be likely to take, from the place you would be likely to come from, if you came this way in May time, you would find the hedges white again in May with voluptuary sweetness. It would be the same at the end of the journey if you came at night like a broken king. If you came by day not knowing what you came for, it would be the same. When you leave the rough road and turn behind the pigsty to the dull facade and the tombstone, and what you thought you came for is only a shell, a husk of meaning, from which the purpose breaks only when it is fulfilled, if at all. Either you had no purpose, or the purpose is beyond the end you figured and is altered in fulfilment. There are other places which also are the world's end. Some at the sea jaws, or over a dark lake, in a desert or a city. But this is the nearest, in place and time, now and in England. If you came this way, taking any route, starting from anywhere, at any time or at any season, it would always be the same. You would have to put off sense and notion. You are not here to verify, instruct yourself, or inform curiosity or carry a report. You are here to kneel where prayer has been valid. And prayer is more than an order of words, the conscious occupation of the praying mind, or the sound of the voice praying. And what the dead had no speech for when living, they can tell you, being dead. The communication of the dead is tongued with fire beyond the language of the living. Here, the intersection of the timeless moment is England and nowhere, never and always. Beautiful reflection on what holy places mean the world over, but the way in which we can be caught by spiritual moments when we give ourselves to the daily discipline of a measure of reflection and center ourselves on scripture within the context of creation. Let's say our prayers and we pray on this day within the Anglican Communion for the Diocese of Shinyanga in Tanzania and Johnson Chinyong Ole, the bishop there and all his people and the Diocese of Eau Claire in the Episcopal Church of the United States, praying for William J. Lambert, the bishop there and his people. Pray for Justin, our Archbishop, for Rose, Bishop of Dover, for Tim, Bishop at Lambeth, and we're continuing to pray for all in need of mental health and well-being. Pray for Lorraine Apps Huggins, the lead chaplain at the Living Well today as we take that intention on this day in Advent. So we say together first, bringing your own intentions, the Advent Collect. Almighty God, 
give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armour of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So we say the prayer our Saviour taught us in whatever language, in, in whichever way you like to say it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. A moment of silence now, as we say our own prayers. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love, and those whom you would pray for, today and always. Amen. Well, you're very quiet this morning. Don't think you like the snow much, really, did you? Thank <laughs> you.